This presentation was given at a policy forum held by Gambling Research Exchange Ontario, GREO, titled Defining, Measuring, and Mitigating Harm. It is part of a series on the real consequences of problem gambling that can be measured and potentially reduced. Dr. Robert Williams presents Predicting and Measuring Gambling-Related Harm in Canada and Internationally. Dr. Robert Williams is a professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences, University of Lethbridge, in Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada, and also a research coordinator for the Alberta Gambling Research Institute. Dr. Williams teaches courses on gambling, provides frequent consultation to government, industry, the media, and public interest groups, regularly gives expert witness testimony on the impacts of gambling, and is the world's best-funded gambling researcher. Dr. Williams is widely published and is a leading authority in the areas of prevention of problem gambling, the etiology of problem gambling, internet gambling, the socioeconomic impacts of gambling, the proportion of gambling revenue deriving from problem gamblers, the prevalence and nature of gambling in Aboriginal communities, and best practices in the population assessment of problem gambling. This video has been professionally narrated based on a presentation made by Dr. Robert Williams at the GRIO Policy Forum on Defining, Measuring, and Mitigating Harm on January 24, 2017. This presentation is largely focused on results of longitudinal studies conducted around the world, with a focus on two Canadian studies. More specifically, we are looking at what factors predict future problem gambling, and presumably those are the same predictors that will predict harm, but we do not know for sure. That is a good empirical question. I'll begin presenting a review of the predictors of gambling problems across these studies. Following that, I'll present some reanalysis I conducted with the data from these studies using a framework similar to Erica Langham's Victorian Taxonomy of Harms to show the percentage and number of people in three provinces who were experiencing the gambling-related harms we measured. An issue in cross-sectional studies which capture a single snapshot in time is that correlates, factors that we observe as relating to problem gambling, are not necessarily predictors. Often they are, but you need large-scale longitudinal studies to truly understand the temporal sequence of events. There are a small number of these studies that use large sample sizes and multi-year assessments, some of which are shown here. The Quintine Longitudinal Study, QLS, was done in Ontario, so we'll talk about the Leisure, Lifestyle, and Life Cycle Project, LLLP, done in Alberta, the Victorian Gambling Study done in Australia, the SWE logs in Sweden, the New Zealand Gambling Study, and the latest one is the Massachusetts Gambling Impact Cohort, or MAGIC. These are the studies that would be drawn on in terms of results throughout this presentation, examining factors that predict future problem gambling. These are the two large-scale Canadian studies, the Quintine Longitudinal Study and the Leisure, Lifestyle, and Life Cycle Project. These studies are available online by a general browser search and are much more detailed than what I will be covering today. Briefly, the LLLP is funded by the Alberta Gambling Research Institute. The study was conducted from 2006 to 2014 with 1,327 Alberta adults from four regions of Alberta, approximating the Alberta population, with oversampling of at-risk individuals. The study included five comprehensive assessments conducted 17 to 27 months apart. This study ran concurrent with the Quinty Longitudinal Study, and I was a principal investigator in both studies. This allowed us to coordinate the assessments, so the questionnaires used for the LLLP are very similar to what was used in the QLS. They are extremely comprehensive assessments of gambling at two to three hours per assessment. They assessed personality, leisure activities, all mental health issues, all forms of gambling, intelligence, educational achievement, a very comprehensive list of variables which were measured to determine if they related to future problem gambling. So the dependent variable for the study was future problem gambling as measured by a score of 5 or higher on the Canadian Problem Gambling Index, the CPGI, based on latest research suggesting that 5 plus is a better demarcation in terms of consistency with clinically assessed problem gamblers. The QLS was run here in Ontario, funded by the Ontario Problem Gambling Research Centre, OPGRC, and involved 4,000 Ontario adults from the Quinty region in southeastern Ontario. Similar to the LLLP, the study used annual, very comprehensive assessments, the assessments were slightly more efficient, with the average assessment taking about one hour to conduct. The dependent variable here was a designation of problem or pathological gambler, as measured by the Problem and Pathological Gambling Measure, PPGM. In terms of identifying the factors that predict future problem gambling, we want to begin by developing a methodological strategy. The main thing we are looking for is consistency of prediction across different time intervals. We are looking at variables that predict future problem gambling at assessment number one, assessment number two, assessment number two to three, and so on. Once we examine the consistency across time intervals within each data set, we look for consistency across data sets 
from the LLLP and the QLS. This very robust and comprehensive approach allows those key predictor variables to become quite clear. One of the interesting results is that there is no single variable that unambiguously predicts future problem gambling. Rather, there are many different variables involved, each increasing risk to some extent, and present to different degrees in individual future problem gamblers. However, there are certain categories of variables that were much more predictive than others. By far and away, the most important category of variables were the gambling-related variables. Within this category, being an at-risk or problem gambler is the single best predictor of the 130 variables measured of future problem gambling. Speaking to this predictor, Dr. Jamie Weed, Director of Research and Development at Responsible Gambling Council, was one of the first people to identify that problem gambling is a much more unstable entity than we ever presumed. People move in and out of it, and one of the findings these studies confirmed some of Dr. Weeb's early results, that one year is actually a modal or most commonly reported length of duration for a problem gambling episode. Now, a good portion of those people will relapse at a later point, and so, being previously at risk or being a past problem gambler of the 130 variables is the strongest predictor of becoming a problem gambler in the future. Intensity of gambling involvement is the second best predictor. Intensity refers to total gambling expenditure, overall frequency, total time spent, and number of formats played. Those are the four dimensions of gambling involvement. Additionally, each of those dimensions were individually predictive of future problem gambling. Higher frequency of involvement in continuous forms, that is, forms of gambling that can be played for long periods without a break, unlike the weekly lottery, is the third best predictor. This is typified by involvement with electronic gambling machines, EGMs, casino table games, and instant lotteries. Other strong predictors included a big win in the past year. These studies were the first longitudinal studies to empirically demonstrate something that we have known anecdotally for many years, that a big win is predictive of over-involvement subsequently. Gambling as a top leisure pursuit. We asked people about their gardening, their television watching, etc. People who gamble as a form of leisure were much more at risk from gambling. Social context, meaning friends or family who are regular or problem gamblers. Part of this is genetic, Part of it is socio-cultural, but it is a strong risk factor nonetheless. Gambling to escape or win money. Again, we have known anecdotally for many years that gambling is a maladapted coping strategy used by some individuals, and it is a bad coping strategy because gambling exacerbates the harms in your life it does not improve them, even though they provide an escape. That inappropriate motivation for gambling is a very strong predictor. More gambling fallacies. That has been identified as a risk factor for many years. It was not found to be as strong as people had always presumed. It is not the main driver. There are many individuals who have gambling fallacies. The general public has many gambling fallacies, but most of them are not problem gamblers. And similarly, there's a subsection of pathological gamblers who have no gambling fallacies. They know exactly how things work, but they don't care. We have to get around the notion that individuals are simply gambling to win money. In fact, most problem gamblers gambling for the excitement, the escape. They may know the odds and everything else about it, but it is irrelevant to them. Nonetheless, having fallacies about how gambling works is a risk factor. Internet gambling, presumably because of the continuous availability, is a strong predictor. Proximity to EGM venues, another strong predictor. Personality was the next category with the strongest predictive power. Within this category, impulsivity is the aspect of personality that was the strongest. We have known that from other longitudinal studies, and I will summarize that later in this presentation, but certain impulsive people have a considerably higher risk of future problem gambling than any other personality type. There are a few other strong personality predictors. This is from an instrument called the NEO Personality Inventory, based on the five factors of personality. There are a couple other personality factors that show up. Vulnerability to stress, lower agreeableness, lower conscientiousness. Those last two can be difficult to get your head around, but the interesting thing is that it is the same combination of personality factors that is predictive of future drug addiction. We are not entirely clear how this works, but it's interesting to note when you look at personality predictors of future addictions and substance abuse, it is the same individuals. Mental health was the next most important category of predictors for future problem gambling. Within this category, depression is the strongest predictor. We measured a comprehensive set of mental health issues, from bulimia to psychotic symptoms to PTSD, social anxiety, and many more. We used operationalizations of the DSM criteria. We looked at a very comprehensive set. Depression has always been associated with gambling problems, and now we know from these longitudinal studies that it is the strongest predictor of all mental health conditions. However, other anxiety-related disorders were also predictive. 
as well, substance abuse was predictive, behavioral addictions, such as shopping, sex, exercise addiction, were predictive. Lifetime history of mental health problems or addiction to drugs and or alcohol were other fairly strong predictive factors. Lastly, other fairly strong and or consistent predictors, which weren't as robust as the others, but nonetheless showed up, stressful events in the past year, lower IQ, lower educational attainment, lower happiness, higher stress, history of child abuse, antisocial traits, physical disability, and or poorer physical health. When you conduct analyses like these, many of these identified factors are predictive, but not necessarily because of the individual variable, but because they are correlated with another construct. To address this, we use a multivariate approach, which analyzes more than one variable at a time to see what factors are still predictive when you examine their predictive power collectively. The essential result of this approach was that most of the multivariate predictors are also gambling related. Basically, the same things identified before. Being at risk or problem gambler in the past, was still the biggest predictor, a big win in the past year, frequency of continuous gambling involvement, family members who are regular gamblers, gambling as an escape to win money. The majority of the gambling-related predictors in the multivariate context remain the main drivers. The only non-gambling predictors that persisted in a multivariate approach were impulsivity, having a behavioral addiction, lifetime history of addiction to drugs or alcohol, family history of mental health problems, when predicting future problem gambling, it is important to distinguish between individuals who have become problem gamblers for the very first time versus those who have relapsed. We divided those two groups apart to determine what variables predicted first-time problem gamblers versus relapse problem gamblers. The result was that nearly all gambling-related variables were predictive of first-onset problem gambling, the exceptions being proximity to EGM venues and being at-risk or problem gamblers, which were more predictive of continuation and relapse. The proximity finding is an important result that we now understand the relationship between gambling availability and problem gambling, that availability is actually a reasonably weak predictor of the onset of problem gambling, but it is identified as a strong predictor largely due to its role in facilitating the relapse of problem gamblers. They have a hard time driving by that casino, much more so than people who have simply been to the casino ever. Several personality, mental health, stress-related cognitive and physical health variables are also implicated in first onset problem gambling. However, in general, these variables are more strongly implicated in problem gambling continuation and relapse. It's these comorbidities and these personality attributes that are causing people to fall back into problem gambling after they've recovered. So those are important factors as well. Another aspect to understand is that of proximal predictors versus long-term predictors. We looked at factors that predicted only next year onset versus things that predicted onset three, four, five years later. The result is that the majority of predictors created risk for all future time periods. That being said, there are a subset of these variables that are consistently present prior to the first onset. And again, intensive gambling involvement is the strongest and most consistent of those. There is not any individual who became a problem gambler who did not have really intensive gambling involvement preceding it. And it is a further takeaway in terms of policy and developing low-risk guidelines for gambling, for example. If we want to prevent problem gambling, we need to prevent the onset, which is preceded by that heavy gambling involvement. Other strong and consistent predictors of imminent problem gambling, having a big win in the past year, gambling being a favorite leisure pursuit, impulsivity, depression. The last thing we did was to look at the stories of problem gamblers. We saw a great opportunity here in that every time someone became a problem gambler, they scored above a certain level on the PPGM or PGSI. They are all asked an open-ended question, what caused your problem gambling? That provided us with roughly 1,000 stories collected from people who became problem gamblers throughout this longitudinal study. Now a good portion, perhaps about a quarter of these individuals, said, I don't have a problem, when asked that question. But for those who did, most problem gamblers identified a singular cause, compared to the empirical results, which indicate many variables are involved. We found that self-reported causes tend to focus on stress, boredom, depression, social pressure to gamble, psychological, motivational, and social influences. There are two things to characterize from these findings. One is that self-reports tend to focus on a single cause versus the empirical reports that tend to indicate a multitude of factors and causes that contribute. Second, the self-reported attributions to psychological, motivational, and social influences are validated by empirical results. However, they indicate a lack of awareness of the broader contextual determinants, past history, having a big win, personality, substance abuse, etc. And in fact, 
we think that this lack of insight is itself a risk factor for problem gambling. The next few slides summarize the predictors identified through several other longitudinal studies around the world, some much more circumscribed, some large scale. Depression was identified in eight studies as a predictor, impulsivity in seven studies, alcohol problems in six studies, less education and or poor school performance in six studies, antisociality and or conduct disorder in six studies, prior problem gambling and or subclinical problem gambling in five studies, illicit drug use or abuse in five studies, tobacco use in five studies, stress and or emotional distress in five studies, poor health and or physical disability in five studies. Many of the same factors were identified. The issue with this listing is that most studies did not do a comprehensive assessment of all these different constructs. They focused on the likely ones. For example, depression is always considered a likely factor, so it's always routinely assessed, whereas a factor like IQ is virtually never assessed. So this list is not necessarily conclusive, but shows the totality of the evidence in terms of all the longitudinal studies. Continuing with the summary here, with the number of studies shown for each of these predictors, intensity of gambling involvement, continuous forms of gambling, anxiety-related disorders, family or friends who are regular or problem gamblers, financial or employment concerns, significant life events, male gender, early onset of gambling, vulnerability to stress, lower agreeableness, lower conscientiousness, history of child abuse, internet gambling, gambling to escape or win money, having gambling fallacies, lower IQ, being an immigrant, are each seen in two of the longitudinal studies. And this slide lists numerous factors that were identified in one of the longitudinal studies. In summary, the worldwide longitudinal research identifies a high degree of consensus on the etiological role, meaning having a role in the causation or origination of the condition of several main categories of variables. Gambling involvement, including intensive gambling involvement, prior history of problem gambling, subclinical problem gambling, continuous forms of gambling, family or friends being regular and or problem gamblers, mental health problems, particularly the ones in the mood spectrum and anxiety spectrum, substance use and abuse, personality, antisociality, lower educational attainment, poor health and or physical disability. When you add all this up, it confirms what we've always believed about the etiology of problem gambling, which is a holistic, biological, psychological, and social etiology with multiple risk and protective factors. The particular pattern of risk and protective factors that an individual problem gambler has and the cause of the problem gambling will often be unique. As a clinician by trade, I have seen many problem gamblers as there are patterns of causes that lead to problem gambling. There are many different routes that lead to the same problem gambling. That being said, many of the strongest risk factors tend to be prevalent across individuals. High levels of gambling expenditure, frequency, time, number of formats, involvement in continuous forms. These factors create the greatest imminent and direct risk of problem gambling. Heavy gambling also increases the risk of a big win, which is itself an independent risk factor of problem gambling. Recovery from problem gambling is common, as the modal problem gambling episode is one year, but relapse is also very common. Past history of problem gambling being the strongest predictor, along with mental health problems and associated comorbidities. You do not see relapse to the same extent in people without those comorbidities. This is a complex etiological model that integrates all our results. This model is included in the LLLP and QLS reports as well. Essentially, it attempts to summarize the evidence in terms of the factors that cause problem gambling, with heavy gambling being the greatest direct risk factor. The width of these arrows indicates the strength of that relationship and its bi-directionality because problem gambling also causes heavy gambling. Others are more unidirectional. Impulsivity is more the cause of problem gambling and not vice versa. However, problem gambling is also a cause of mental health problems. Implications. There is no silver bullet for problem gambling. Rather, there is a wide variety of initiatives needed to address its multifaceted biopsychosocial etiology. Any individual initiative, whether it is low risk guidelines for gambling or others, will have modest impact on their own, but if they are coordinated along with other responsible gambling initiatives, they can have synergistic effects. Generic school-based prevention programs that target a wide range of risk behaviors are needed. Many of the risk factors for delinquency, mental health problems, etc. are the same risk factors for problem gambling. School-based initiatives that are directed at at-risk behaviors and mental health, more generally, are a more efficient way of doing this as opposed to gambling-specific prevention programs. Treatment of substance abuse and mood disorders will reduce both the incidence of new cases, because these are the drivers of new cases, but also will have a significant impact on problem gambling relapse. This includes family physicians or treatment for mental health disorders. There needs to be a high awareness of problem gambling as a potential comorbid condition, and aggressive treatment of these mental health comorbidities will have significant impact on reducing the relapse of problem gambling.
Policy interventions need to limit progression to intensive gambling. Generally, continuous forms of gambling, such as slots, table games, should be eliminated, reduced in number, or constrained in how they operate. We should not be incentivizing gambling involvement. That always struck me as peculiar. You do not incentivize other risk behaviors. You can't go to the bar and drink six drinks and get the seventh free, but we do that for gambling. This is very counterintuitive. Incentivization of gambling consumption is not a good idea. If there is a desire for reward programs, they should incentivize what we are trying to achieve, which is responsible gambling. For example, you gamble up to $200, and then you don't receive any reward points beyond that. Or, you gamble up to $200, and if you read this promotional message about responsible gambling strategies, you get an additional 200 reward points. There are ways to operationalize responsible gambling rather than gambling consumption, such as automated interventions to alert players to risky behavior. There is a lot of evidence indicating those strategies are useful. Mandatory player pre-commitment, limited availabilities of ATMs and smoking, and reducing general availability of gambling, which is shown to have a modest impact on incidents, but an important role in reducing relapse. These are all policy initiatives, but it does not preclude the need for education because that interacts with policy, correcting gambling fallacies and inappropriate gambling motivations, particularly to escape and to win money. Overall, education is doing a good job on certain aspects already. It's really the policy side that needs more work. Limitations. I want to contextualize the results we just talked about. These studies have largely focused on predictors and etiology of problem gambling meaning individuals with impaired control over their gambling and experiencing significant harm resulting from that impaired control. Other studies focus on predictors of higher levels of problem gambling symptomatology, simply the set of symptoms characterized by a condition. But those are not necessarily predictors of harm. We don't know if these same predictors predict harm. My guess is that they do, but it is an important empirical question. This slide follows up on that. Predictors of problem gambling symptomatology are not necessarily the same predictors of harm in the population. The issue is that the instruments do not necessarily include items that entail harm. Questions on preoccupation of gambling, tolerance, going back next day, guilt, gambling more than intended. There could be an argument that those are harm related, but they can also be argued to be ambiguous. The other problem is that most problem gambling instruments do not comprehensively assess harm. Certain forms of harm are only covered in some instruments. The reason we use the PPGM is that it was originally developed 10 or 15 years ago to measure harm. We saw a deficit within the existing instruments in that most of the instruments were not covering terms like illegal activity or schoolwork problems. The way the PPGM is structured is that to be identified as a problem gambler, you must have unambiguous evidence of significant problems. And those problems are basically reflective of the Victorian taxonomy of problem gambling harms developed by Erica Langham's team. Financial, mental health, relationships, school, illegal activity. You must have evidence of an impaired control over your gambling. The other part of the PPGM is that these questions not only ask whether these harms occur to you, but to someone in your immediate social network. All of these items from the other instruments are mostly referring to problems experienced by the gamblers, as opposed to their social network. With these limitations in mind, and for this presentation today, I reanalyze the data from three of these longitudinal studies to extract the percentage of people experiencing gambling-related harms. I looked only at the problem items from the PPGM using a framework similar to Erica Langham's taxonomy of harms. Now keep in mind, this is a very conservative measure of harm that we're asking people, did you experience significant financial problems or a significant mental health problem? When we look at our prevalence study of Alberta for 2008-2009, problem gambling prevalence was 2.5%. This represents the percentage and number of people who endorsed each of those problem harm items. This demonstrates the relative prevalence of the different harms using this conservative but fairly unambiguous measure of harm and comparing that to what makes a problem gambler. As you see, it's significantly higher and certain types of harms, financial problems, mental health problems, are more prevalent than others. Under mental health problems, we posed a follow-up question on suicidal thoughts stemming from mental health problems. Under relationship problems, we also posed a follow-up question on child welfare involvement as an additional problem stemming from relationship problems. This gives you an idea of the actual number of people who report neglecting their children because of their gambling, and they may or may not be problem gamblers. We did the same thing in Ontario using data from 2010 and 2011. However, the last prevalence study in Ontario was conducted in 2010, and the problem gambler rate at the time was 2.2%, which is significantly higher than when we looked at the harms questions. This means our harm rates may be underestimates. Lastly, most recently, we conducted the Massachusetts study in 2013. 
here again, there is a much higher rate of harms. We also get an idea of how common divorce is, or how common being arrested is. They are rare, but still occur. Again, this reanalysis of historical data follows this newer approach to understanding harms and working to prevent them. Thank you. Thank you.